This is the twelfth in the Divided Kingdom video series. We completed the 20 kings of the Northern Kingdom first. Now we're working our way through the 20 kings of the Southern Kingdom. In the last video, we learned that King Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah for 25 years and consistently turned to the Lord for help. When faced with his greatest challenge, he passed with flying colors. On the other hand, he still made some pretty significant mistakes. Blunders which would have disastrous effect on his family and nation. These actions incurred consequences that just simply couldn't be avoided, particularly his one habit of forming mutual alliances with non-believers, and they set in motion a chain of events which nearly destroyed the Davidic line. By far his biggest mistake was purchasing peace with Israel at the expense of marrying his son Jehoram to King Ahab's daughter Athaliah. Today we're going to look at the next five kings of Judah and see how that sin affected his descendants. Now right off there's a problem. Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram is frequently confused with his brother-in-law Joram Joram reigned in the northern kingdom about the same time that Jehoram ruled in the southern kingdom, and their names are so similar. Uh, if you think of Joram as John and Jehoram as Jonathan, you can immediately see the problem. Essentially, they have the same name, and the Bible addresses each king using both names. <laughs> sort of like George Foreman naming all of his sons George. Jehoram was Jehoshaphat's oldest son, one of seven brothers. His name means exalted by Jehovah. So obviously his father had high hopes for this boy. He also had a number of wives, but his first wife was Athaliah, the daughter of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel of the Northern Kingdom. She was half Phoenician, and she worshipped the gods of her mother, so even an idiot should have known that there was going to be big trouble. He had an unknown number of sons, but at least one daughter, whose name was Jehoshaphat, and she married Judah's high priest and will figure prominently later in our story. When Jehoram had ascended the throne of his father and was established, he killed all his brothers with the sword and also some of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David, and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. He made high places in the hill country of Judah and led the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom and made Judah go astray. Athaliah influenced Jehoram toward evil exactly as her mother had influenced King Ahab. Rather than becoming exalted by Jehovah, Jehoram essentially became the Ahab of the southern kingdom. He began his reign by immediately killing off all six of his brothers, plus other relatives in the royal family, uh, basically anyone who would have been a political threat, and then things went downhill from there. He totally abandoned the God of his father, and like Ahab and Jezebel, he and his wife Athaliah actually sponsored false religion in Judah. He deliberately undid everything his father had worked so righteously to accomplish. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have enticed Judah, 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom, as the house of Ahab led Israel into whoredom. And also you have killed your brothers of your father's house, who are better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will bring a great plague on your people, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you yourself will have a severe sickness with a disease of your bowels, until your bowels come out because of the disease, day by day. Day by day. Yuck. Elijah warned him Yahweh would strike a heavy blow against Judah, against his family, and against him personally. He'd suffer a slow, painful, and probably humiliating death. Even that didn't deter him. The Lord aroused the Philistines, the Arabians, and the Cushites to invade Judah. They carried off everything that wasn't nailed down. They plundered Jehoram's palace. They kidnapped his wives. They exterminated most of the royal family Jehoram hadn't already killed off. And by the time they left town, Jehoram was left with only Athaliah and one son. Coincidentally, the Edomites also revolted about this same time period. Jehoram <laughs> almost was killed trying unsuccessfully to stop him, and a small community named Libna on his western border with Philistia also revolted, and Second Chronicles 21 specifically says, quote, because he had forsaken the Lord. And after all this, the Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. In the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. His people made no fire in his honor, like the fires made for his fathers. He was thirty-two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. He lost all his wives except Athaliah. He lost all of his children except one. And later on, he lost all of his grandchildren except one. His country was invaded by multiple armies. His treasury and temple were plundered <laughs> repeatedly. His vassals revolted. And finally, Yahweh struck him with a disease that required his bowels to be removed. <laughs> oh, that must be horrible. He suffered intense pain for two long years, and then finally he died to no one's regret. Only eight years before, his nation had been prosperous, content, even happy under the righteous reign of his father, King Jehoshaphat. But by the end of Jehoram's bitter eight years, Judah had returned to idolatry. They had lost land and treasure. Enemies were again facing them on all sides. The nation was so afflicted, and Jehoram was so obviously to blame, he was refused burial in the royal sepulcher. Instead, he was buried in a common grave outside the city. There's another problem with uh, Jehoram. Second Chronicles 21.17 says Jehoram's only surviving son was Jehoahaz. <laughs> but the very next chapter says Jehoram's only surviving son was Ahaziah. Now since the Bible calls both Jehoahaz and Ahaziah the youngest son, they the, both passages must clearly be talking about the same guy, but I have absolutely no explanation why the names are different, <laughs> just one chapter apart. I use the name Ahazai because that's the name, the chart I'm using from my own study Bible uses. Um, if you want to mentally substitute uh, Jehoahaz every time I say Ahaziah, talking about this particular king, eh, I, that's fine with me. But Ahaziah became king at the age of 22, and he lasted one year. 
Like his father, he followed the sins of Ahab and was greatly influenced by his evil mother, Athaliah, who you'll remember was Ahab's daughter. Just as his grandfather, King Jehoshaphat, was talked into attacking Syria to help out King Ahab, well, Ahab's son talked Ahaziah into attacking King Hazael of Syria. Second Chronicles 22 tells us pointedly that Ahaziah was advised, this is a quote, advised by the house of Ahab to his undoing. Unquote. Now, do you remember who appointed or anointed Hazael to be king over Syria? Elisha. Yeah, Yahweh told Elijah to do it. Elijah must have handed it off to Elisha. Do you remember what God's purpose was for having King Hazael be king over Syria. Yeah, it was to attack Ahab and punish Israel. Now, do you remember who was anointed to get rid of Ahab's entire family and become the next king of Israel? Jehu. Right, you get a gold star. So, Needless to say, fighting against Hazael was probably not the best idea in the world. King Joram and King Ahaziah set off to meet Hazael's forces at Ramoth. Joram was wounded in the battle and returned to Jezreel to recuperate. Ahaziah visited him there, and through this visit, God brought about the downfall of Ahaziah. Do you remember how Ahaziah was related to King Ahab? Grandson. Close enough for Jehu. <laughs> he killed both kings along with countless other relatives. And although he threw Joram's body into the field that Ahab had stolen from Naboth, he had King Ahaziah's body buried properly because, quote, he was the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart. Unquote. Even after his death, Jehoshaphat's righteousness continues to affect others around him. Well, the next king of Judah was a queen, or a female. In fact, she was the only female to reign in either the northern or southern kingdom. Queen Athaliah was the daughter of King Ahab, the sister of King Joram, the wife of King Jehoram, and mother of King Ahaziah. <laughs> These were her only credentials. She was to Judah what Queen Jezebel was to Israel, and her name means whom God afflicts. And she was definitely an affliction to Judah. She walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, and through her, Judah essentially became a vassal state of the northern kingdom throughout the reigns of Jehoram, Ahaziah, and herself. After the deaths of her husband and her son, Athaliah made her move on the vacant throne by immediately trying to exterminate all of Ahaziah's possible heirs, her own grandchildren. As in the case with Jehoram, where all of his sons were killed except the youngest. Likewise, all of Ahaziah's sons were killed except the youngest, Joash. And he was less than one year old at the time. Joash's aunt, Jehosheba, remember her? <laughs> and her husband, Jehoiada, the high priest, hid him in the temple for the next six years while Athaliah ruled the land. Then the high priest organized the royal guard to surround and protect the child while he instructed him in the temple. Priests provided weapons previously belonging to King David, which had been dedicated to the Lord's use. And after six years, Jehoiada led a rebellion which toppled Athaliah's government. 
he ordered her execution, then crowned Joash, the rightful king of Judah. Then they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king, and Jehoiada and his sons anointed him, and they said, Long live the king! And when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. And when she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets, and the singers with their musical instruments leading in the celebration. And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains who were set over the army, saying to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, Do not put her to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went into the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, and they put her to death there. And Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king, that they should be the Lord's people. A long, long time ago, God had promised King David that his descendants would rule perpetually. One of the major differences between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom was the stability of one ruling family throughout the entire kingdom period. But after Jehoram had exterminated all his brothers and then enemies hauled off and killed all of Jehoram's sons, except one, and then Jehu exterminated that last son, Ahaziah, along with a bunch more of Judah's ruling family, and then Athaliah exterminated the rest of the royal family, again, all except for one. It looked like the candle of David's lineage and that promise Yahweh had made so long ago was just about snuffed out. I mean, we are down to one player in the game. Do you see how all of this happened? Simply because the righteous king Jehoshaphat arranged a marriage between his son and Ahab's daughter. He shouldn't have done it. But he did. And that single remaining descendant of King David survived. And Joash assumed the throne when he was seven years old. The youngest king to reign on the throne in Judah. He reigned for 40 years. And his kingship seems like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Or maybe more like King Asa, who reigned righteously for, what, 35 years and then turned his back on God. Well, in the case of Joash, while the kindly high priest and mentor Jehoiada was alive, Joash promoted worship of Yahweh. He observed the law. He rededicated the people to Yahweh. He repaired the temple and reinstituted a temple tax. <clears throat> he even had the priest set up a collection box where people could bring enormous amounts of money for the building project. And when the temple was completed, the excess money was used to make dishes and articles of service for the temple. Unfortunately, after his father figure died, Joash fell away from the Lord. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, and he reigned forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. Then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, 
Why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they conspired against him, and by command of the king they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. On the advice of government bureaucrats, Joash abandoned the temple of the Lord and began worshiping idols. He ordered the stoning of his mentor's son, Zechariah, who had enough concern to confront him about his sin. But isn't this exactly what the Lord had been telling them all along? You do this, and I'll do this. If you seek me, I'll make sure you find me. If you forsake me, I'll forsake you. Isn't that exactly what Azariah told King Asa not too long ago? This is not new news. Eventually and inevitably, God always does what he says he'll do. So, within a year, that guy from Syria, whose job it was to execute judgment on Israel, <laughs> what's his name again? Uh, Hazael will come and visit Judah also. At the end of the year, the army of the Syrians came up against Joash. They came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. Though the army of the Syrians had come with few men, the Lord delivered into their hand a very great army because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. Thus they executed judgment on Joash. Because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, Joash was wounded. Later, he was even murdered by his own servants. The seven-year-old boy king, who, like Asa, began with such great promise, ended so miserably. When they had departed from him, leaving him severely wounded, his servants conspired against him because of the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest, and killed him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. Joash was another one of those kings that didn't get buried in the royal sepulcher. But ironically, <laughs> Jehoiada, the high priest who mar uh, married into the royal family, was. Jehoiada grew old and full of days, and died. He was 130 years old at his death, and they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel and toward God and his house. It's also interesting that Joash is one of only three kings totally omitted by Matthew when he writes the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. Well, although he might have been a cute little king at the age of seven, it's really difficult for me to call this guy a righteous king since he ended so badly. But I guess I'm <laughs> really in no position to throw stones or to know for sure. And besides all that, it's not my call anyway. Scripture calls him righteous. Maybe someone should do a study on what the writer actually means with the phrase doing right in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, I equate doing right with imputed righteousness and salvation and trying to obey the Lord. But maybe the writer means simply doing what the Lord intended to him to do in the first place. I don't know. But if that's the case, then certainly Jehu should have been righteous too, and he wasn't. None of the kings in the northern kingdom were righteous. So, again, I just don't know. Well, Joash did die, but not before he had a son to continue that long, unbroken chain of David's descendants, just as God had promised. Amaziah became king at the age of 25, and he reigned for 29 years. And, of course, the first thing he did was kill the two guys who murdered his dad. But he did not wipe out their entire family. 
just the two wrongdoers. So that's pretty good, I guess. His name means strengthened by Yahweh, or Yahweh is mighty. Uh, Amaziah was a good administrator. He strengthened his military, and he was the first to hire independent contractors to beef up the army. He hired 100,000 Israelite soldiers to help fight the Edomites, but the Lord told him to send them all back, and he obeyed, much to the annoyance of the now unemployed mercenaries, and because he obeyed, the Lord gave him a decisive victory over the Edom Edomites. Yet the most amazing thing happened. When he came back from striking down the Edomites, he brought home their false gods and set them up as his gods, and he worshipped them. This made the Lord very angry, and he sent Amaziah a prophet with no name. After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore the Lord was angry with Amaziah, and sent to him a prophet, who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop! Why should you be struck down? So the prophet stopped, but said, I know that God has determined to destroy you, because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. Throughout the divided kingdom years, God used military defeat as punishment, just as he promised in that Palestinian covenant. Second Chronicles 25 specifically says that Amaziah wouldn't listen because it was of God. His end came when he challenged Joash, king of Israel, to step outside and settle their dispute man to man. <laughs> mono el mono. I guess. Joash responded with an insult, suggesting that maybe Amaziah was pretty big for his britches after beating up on a little Edomite. Then Amaziah, king of Judah, took counsel and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. And Joash, the king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judah. A thistle on Lebanon sent to a cedar on Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled down the thistle. You say, See, I have struck down Edom and your heart has lifted you up in boastfulness. But now stay at home. Why should you provoke trouble so that you fall, you and Judah with you? But Amaziah would not listen, for it was of God, in order that he might give them into the hand of their enemies, because they had sought the gods of Edom. So Joash king of Israel went up, and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, Amaziah was thoroughly trounced in this battle, trounced and humiliated. His army fled in panic. Amaziah was captured. Israel knocked down Jerusalem's protective wall for 400 cubits, the Bible says. That's about two football fields or a couple hundred yards. And, of course, they stopped by the temple to make a withdrawal. <laughs> Everybody that comes to town does that. They stripped Amaziah's palace bare and then hauled him off, along with a bunch of others, to Samaria as hostages. Amaziah couldn't come back until after Joash died, but then he did get to go home, but there was no welcoming party. He was chased out of town by his own people and murdered. From the time when he turned away from the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and put him to death there. The Bible says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. So once again we see that 
in not being fully committed to the Lord, another king sets himself up for failure. Amaziah became puffed up and prideful because of his many accomplishments and forgot that pride leads to destruction. As Christians, we should remember that without God, we have absolutely nothing. Nada. God gives us our talents, our strengths, and our weaknesses. So when we do something right, we shouldn't make such a big deal out of it. Amaziah is yet another king. The Bible records as doing what is right in the God's eyes, yet he caused a great number of problems for his nation and ended his life miserably. In the next video, we'll look at uh, Azariah, Jotham, and Ahaz. And let's see if they can do any better, okay? <laughs> Have a good day.